There we go. Okay, looks good. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome, everybody, once again to Cast Iron Wednesday, which is a uh, long-running tradition that a number of uh, YouTube cooking channels have been doing <clears throat> Excuse me, every Wednesday for the uh, past several years now. Um, here on uh, this uh, channel, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, showing up on this channel. We have been doing it for uh, getting close to three years now. We are at two, uh, since it started in around uh, August or so of uh, 2020, that means we are getting into about two years and nine months of doing a regular weekly uh, live um, live session here on uh, on the, here on Cast Iron Chaos um, with the with a couple of exceptions where we've had to postpone it once in a while and I may have to do that next week um, because well it's a lot of fun to do a cast iron video and it's a, a nice tradition that we've been holding. And I'm very uh, glad to see that uh, people are uh, regularly showing up here, in fact, on here on Cast Iron Wednesday. Uh, I guess just because Cast Iron is so popular and it's, well, so much fun. And at least I certainly think so. Uh, which is why I, I can regularly see names on our uh, chat here. Hello to R.T. Scott and hello to Cynthia Wesley and Rick Stumbo and Rocket Caver and Debbie. And uh, quite a few others here as well um, for uh, yet another uh, session of, uh, well, I guess, <clears throat> talking about cast iron as usual. Uh, because, yeah, we've been uh, trying to do this as uh, something of a uh, you know, tradition or at least a regular schedule that the first cast iron Wednesday of the night, of the month rather, we will uh, once again be talking about cast iron and I'll be showing off the rack. Yet again, um, that's because, well, there are a lot of stories that I love telling about uh, the cast iron on this rack. And more importantly, it's an excuse, I guess, to talk about, uh, well, cast iron of all kinds, vintage, modern, um, you name it. And please feel free to mention your own, uh, your cast iron as well, because that's certainly just as important as uh, what we're seeing here. Um, so that's why I decided to start out by holding up... Um, uh, what's really been uh, a subject of discussion uh, lately, good discussion, fortunately, and that is, of course, the Cracker Barrel, a great seal of the United States cast iron skillet. This, in fact, is the one that was uh, first produced in 2015, several years ago, and this is a 10-inch cast iron skillet with this, uh, with this logo on it. Um, as folks know by now, Cracker Barrel has uh, released a 12-inch skillet uh, with, this, uh, with this very same design uh, this year at their stores. This is the first year where they have only released a 12-inch skillet in their uh, American Heritage series. And I'm curious as to whether they're only going to be releasing these in a 12-inch size from now on. I suppose it really depends on how well the 12-inch uh, skillet sells. Um, Jeff Rogers, the culinary fanatic, he mentioned in, in his uh, Facebook post a, couple, a week or so ago that uh, it seems that, according to Cracker Barrel, the 12-inch skillet has been their most popular seller, and, that may, and that's likely why they decided to do this in a 12-inch size rather than a 10-inch size this year. Um, so the best I could say is that I think it's a very nice design, and if you uh, like one of these... Uh, I would advise getting to Cracker Barrel right away, and no, they're not paying me to say that, uh, especially to uh, yeah, especially to get one of your own, uh, because well, these things always sell out long before the Fourth of July. Granted, because the because the uh, twelve inch skillet is a, is more expensive, it has a forty dollar price tag. In fact, uh, I think it's less likely that it's going to sell out right away. But I would still advise uh, when you feel like it and when you can afford it. And if you have a use for it, <laughs> that's the other thing, uh, you should, you should uh, certainly consider getting the Cracker Bell right away. Uh, do we have to pay for this chat now? Ooh, wait a second. What am I seeing here? Do we have to pay to join the chat now? Uh, no. Not unless YouTube has installed some new rules that, I, that I'm unaware of. 
um, because while I know <clears throat> a lot of uh, YouTube channels have uh, setting setting up uh, paid subscriptions that members can uh, do, uh, I am not doing that. As far as I know, this channel is still free. Um, I passed on a ten and a half inch Taiwan skillet, says Debbie. Only four ninety nine, but I don't need it. Well, yeah, that's the that's the the, the thing. And that's the case for a lot of us as well who have, well, collections like this. I mean, I have to keep telling myself again and again, no, I really don't need another skillet. And yet it seems like every so often uh, something comes up where I still just can't pass it up. But there you go. I mean, even though that skillet was $4.99, like you said, I mean, if you don't need it, well, um, there's really not much of a reason to get it. That's for sure. Uh, Debbie's lagging my, my condolences. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, there's always a use for cast iron, even if, even if it's for defense. Well, that's certainly true. Um, and I like to think I've got a good enough co collection here that I couldn't, uh, <clears throat> that I would certainly be able to defend myself if somebody were to break into my home. So <laughs> I watch it on TV and chat on my phone. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about your uh, connection, Linda. Hello, Flash1999, and hello, William Hurt as well. And now I think I should stand up because, ugh, I think I prefer doing these things standing up rather than sitting down. Yeah, it feels better, and I can get some exercise in this way as well. So besides, this way I'll be able to uh, go back and forth and uh, point out and grab any of the uh, pieces in the um, here on the rack. If anybody is, uh, if anybody has any questions about anything that's here, I have yet another rack of uh, cast iron still sitting in the kitchen as well. And unfortunately, I don't. Um, as far as I could tell, YouTube Live here unfortunately does not have the, does not have a multi camera option. So it's not like I can switch from one camera to another, unfortunately. Uh, but we will uh, get to that, I guess. Um, yeah, look at you, uh, Corey, multitasker. <laughs> uh, that price is a great gift. Oh, oh <laughs> I guess you're talking about $4.99 for the Taiwan skillet, I guess. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> anyway, that was the uh, Cracker Barrel skillet. And, of course, uh, Cracker Bell has been uh, releasing these now for good grief, going on uh, about uh, not just 10 years, but I believe 12 and 13 years now. So, Elsie's cat. I once bought a 10 inch lodge, a, a 10 lodge on sale, went home and took a nap, bought a lodge chicken fryer that same evening. <laughs> well, at least you have them. That's the best I could say as well. Uh, hello, uh, the mud brooker. Uh, oh, uh, it's nice to leave a tip for the host. Well, well, thank you very much. And well, it's not so much that it annoys me. I mean, it's more like it's like I'm not asking for uh, donations. So, I mean, I know there are many uh, YouTube channels that live on donations. You know, people are trying to make a living off of their uh, off of their online channels. And um, I can only say that because I work a full time job, I've said quite a few times, I consider this to be more of a hobby. Um, and, uh, and a stress relief and I've uh, really enjoyed it that way. So, uh, okay, Linda, no, we do not have to pay to join the conversation. Let me say that directly. You do not have to pay to join this YouTube live session. No one has to pay. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, again, the mud brooker was kind enough to, uh, you know, kind enough to make that uh, little donation there. And again, I wasn't really asking for it. So, um, what's the lid on the floor to your left? Um, okay. To my left, I guess you're talking about this one here. This in fact is not cast iron. <laughs> Rather, it is an aluminum lid. And I got this largely because it's the right size. It's a 15-inch lid, um, and I got this at a restaurant store. And best of all, it fits uh, a number uh, a number 14 size cast iron skillet very nicely. Because um, on one hand, I have yet to find a BSR uh, number 14 size lid that would fit on old Stumpy there, and I'm not even sure they made them. Uh, likewise, 14-inch lids are uh, rather hard to find. I, I will say that as well. 
although I do know that uh, Cabela's is Cabela's still uh, making its own house brand cast iron at this point. Um, I'm not sure because Cabela's for a while was selling uh, cast iron lids on their own at uh, pretty decent prices too. You could get up to a 20 inch size lid at Cabela's for about 50 bucks and that actually wasn't so bad. And hello, LC's cat. Well, well, again, thank you very much. I mean, again, that's uh, really all I could do is thank you very much for, uh, for the donation. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie's cat. Uh, very uh, been for the bandwagon. Um, well, I guess if nothing else, that you, um, <clears throat> that at least I should be able to find some do something to uh, you know for your uh, donation. And thank you for that. Whether it's you, whether you have anything special to ask uh, or otherwise, but I'm still uh, free open for uh, general conversation here. Any Martin stove and range cast iron in your collection? At this time, the only Martin stove and range I have in my collection are, in fact, these ashtray skillets. Uh, these, as best as I can tell from the design here, you see how they're very wide and actually very straight. They're different shape from your typical Wagner or Lodge uh, ashtrays. My understanding is that these were made by, in fact, by Martin stove. Even though both of these happen, one says Atlanta Stove Works and one says Birmingham Stove and Range. <laughs> but uh, that's because, of course, they were advertiser skillets. But as far as I can tell, these are Martin. Um, <clears throat> I did come across a Martin, uh, I think it was a hamburger logo uh, skillet. Uh, good grief. Going on just about 10 years ago, in fact. Yes, I definitely remember it was 10 years ago. Um, in 2013, and I found it uh, at a church rummage sale. You know, those uh, thrift stores that uh, many churches often have. Uh, I happened to come across that one, and I believe I paid $5 for it. And I seasoned it up nicely, and I remember holding it in my hand and thinking this was one of the heaviest cast iron skillets I'd ever held at that time. It would definitely felt heavier than a, lot, than a modern day lodge skillet. I seasoned that one up, and in fact, I took it to, uh, with me on my uh, trip to the um, National uh, Dutch Oven Gathering of uh, 2013, which was in Oklahoma. And I gave that skillet, in fact, to my host as a present when I stayed in uh, Tennessee uh, at that time. So I, I did leave that behind, and that was the last uh, Martin stove uh, piece of cast iron that I have uh, owned, unfortunately, because I have not yet come across any others uh, in the in the hunt, at least not at a price that I felt uh, would be worth it. Um, and when I say would be worth it, well, like I said, I would prefer to only have users uh, or as few collectors as possible in my in my collection. So I mean, if I found another Martin number eight, what would I do when I already have more than enough number eight skillets? Um, if I found a Martin number three, I'd probably snatch it right up on the other hand. So, <laughs> Sikkim, Cynthia, okay, what is happening here? Hold on. Linda, okay, so Linda is trolling. All right, where are we? Where is Linda then? Let's see what's going on here. There it is. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. All right, um, we are out. There we go. Okay, I've just put her in, uh, I've just hidden her. Sorry about that. I thought she was genuinely asking questions. Mudbrooker, tech sport and, and stand sport made some large skillets with lids meant for camp gear. They're imports and can usually be found fairly cheap. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, they are, besides the fact, of course, that they're Asian made, but then again, so is the Cabela's house brand. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I believe uh, major sporting goods, you know, like Dick's Sporting Goods, for instance, are probably, I'm not, maybe Bass Pro Shops, but I'm not sure. They also regularly have uh, tech sport uh, cast iron as well. So, uh, that would probably be not a bad place to go if you wanted to uh, get a cast iron lid as well. So, okay. Uh, all right. Anyway, getting back to this. Hello, uh, John Surf 5. What brand is your ham boiler? Well, actually it's not a ham boiler, but it is in fact 
Um, I happen to have two DSNR deep fryers. Actually, one DSNR, uh, one Birmingham Stove and Range, and one Lodge. So, uh, because the Lodge uh, deep fryer, I had I managed to acquire uh, a few years ago, and and Lodge was producing that deep fryer for a what for about ten years or so after they acquired it from Birmingham Stove and Range. Let me uh, get this out, in fact, so that I can throw my back out as I lift this thing. Ugh. Mm. Ugh. Here it is. Once again, this is the Lodge Deep Fryer Ugh. with the uh, Wildlife uh, Skillet cover on it. And yeah, this thing is uh, pretty darn heavy. These red things here, by the way, are just uh, cloth that I've stuck in between, you know, to uh, provide uh, circulation inside the pan. Oh, boy. But, yeah, this damn thing is heavy, so I had better put that back. And I am continuing to get a lot of use out of that deep fryer. I really like it. However, it was, was it just last year? God, it's only been a year, I think. I made an what I think ugh, was an incredible discovery at the Brimfield Antique Show. And that was when I happened to come across a BSNR, a Birmingham Stove and Range uh, deep fryer with the, uh, with the old-fashioned uh, square or rectangular-shaped handle, no less. Um, I didn't even know that these even existed until I saw pictures of them. Uh, until I saw at least a couple of pictures of them on the internet a few years ago, and I was absolutely shocked to find one in real life. And this is what I mean as well. It's like this was one of those things I simply could not pass up when I uh, when I came across it, especially since I ended up getting it for forty bucks. So yeah, could not help it. Uh, you know, this is not the exact same size as that later model of the uh, deep fryer because that lodge lid will not completely fit onto this deep fryer here. Ugh. And I've been trying to find something that would uh, serve as a uh, lid for that deep fryer as well. Yeah, I, I know, 40 bucks. I would think I would think so as well. How many times have you encountered hammered Griswold pieces? I myself, never. I've, I mean, yeah, I can say just about anything. I've seen photos of them on the internet, but I have never come across a hammered Griswold myself. Uh, not even on uh, in all of the antique malls I've, and uh, flea markets and antique fairs I've visited. I've never seen a hammered Griswold myself. So um, I've no doubt that they're out there, but I have seen hammered Wagners much more often than I've seen hammered Griswold. And then there is even... A couple of uh, unusual lodge hammered skillets. Um, most famously would be the lodge four-in-one uh, combo cooker, which is a beautiful piece. And then, of course, they have all just started producing a uh, souvenir skillet for their uh, lodge cast iron museum, and it happens to have a hammered design. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I do regret about uh, about not going to the National Cornbread Festival this year, unfortunately, because I was looking forward to the opportunity to get one of those uh, hammered skillets from the Lodge Museum. Well, there is always another time. There's really not much more I can say <laughs> other than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was hammered Saturday. Well, yes, indeed. <laughs> and, and and I was actually pretty hammered myself. Yeah, that's right. This past Saturday, I had a lot of fun playing with cast iron, and some alcohol was involved, too. <laughs> and you are vintage, Corey. Yeah, thankful for hump day. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it is Wednesday, thank goodness. Ugh, a couple more days until the weekend. Um, me, I'm more interested in waiting for the weather to change. Uh, it's actually been raining not constant, well, almost constantly for the past six days since last Friday. And everybody in this area is pretty sick of it, including my cats. So yeah, I'm waiting for the weather to change. And apparently it's finally going to in about another two days or so. <laughs> uh, mine, would, mine would be a Dutch oven since they are useful. Oh, yes. What size is your chicken fryer? I don't know the size. I have a number 10 lid and it might fit it. When you're saying a number 10 lid, here's an important question. Is that a K 
camp oven lid or a skillet or indoor Dutch oven lid because the sizes are different. Um, you know, we know, of course, that uh, in that indoor uh, cookware lid, uh, the size numbers, they were all meant to fit, of course, uh, stove eyes, wood, wood burning stoves. And that's the reason why a uh, number 10 size uh, lid for a number 10 size skillet is actually about uh, just about 12 inches or more uh, in, or, or maybe a little less in diameter. Whereas on the other hand, camp oven lids, the number 10 did actually mean the size of it in that it was a 10, it was a 10 inch diameter lid. Like for instance, we've got one here. This is a large uh, number eight camp oven lid. And it says eight because it's about uh, eight inches in diameter as opposed to a number eight size large cast iron um, yeah, skillet lid. And as you can see, this number eight is much, much smaller than this number eight. So if you say you have a number 10 lid, I, we need to know, does it look like this? Is it a camp oven lid? If it is a camp oven lid, then it will almost certainly fit a number 10, no, a number eight size <laughs> cast iron skillet. So I hope that helps. Uh, close a uh, YouTube notice here. Okay, I'm watching and seasoning more iron. Yeah, and, I, and, that's, a, and that's a good way to do it too. Thank you very much for that. So um, <clears throat> I have a 10 inch Dutch oven lid that I also use for my skillet and chicken fryer. Okay, that probably means that it's an in, that's an indoor Dutch oven lid. So, so uh, that would answer that right there. If you have that number ten lid, you, it would work just fine with your uh, with any uh, typical number eight cast iron and cast iron skillet. So, and I do hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, uh, this uh, particular lodge, this number eight size uh, camp oven. Was I also managed to win in the 2011, boy, it's been 12 years, 2011 uh, National Dutch Oven Gathering. Uh, that was kind of like a door prize that, that I was lucky enough to find. And I'm told, uh, somebody may want to correct me on this. I'm told Lodge may have actually discontinued the number eight size camp oven. Apparently, this is something of a rarity. Or maybe Lodge may have temporarily discontinued it and then is producing it again which they do from time to time. Coming again this weekend, Dos Vasco's Farm. I have a raised number eight black lock chicken fryer and nothing fits. Um, okay, well, okay, black lock. Raised number eight. Okay, that raised number eight that you say is black lock, unfortunately, probably is not black lock. Um, number one, Nobody, unfortunately, has any records to verify exactly what black lock uh, cast iron pans looked like. Uh, there are guesses that it probably lo probably looks something similar to that raised number eight that you have there, uh, but nobody can be absolutely sure. However, if that number eight does not fit a modern day or standard size lodge lid, then it's actually not Lodge or Black Lock. It's more like an SMS, a Southern Mystery Skillet. I've come across a couple of those, and I owned a couple of those briefly for every so often as well. Those particular number eight Southern Mystery Skillets, they are in fact very slightly smaller in size than your uh, typical number eight pans from Lodge or Wagner or Griswold and the like. And the most reason why they're and the reason why they're so sm they're smaller, most people believe they were actually recasts using um, actual lodge skillets as the uh, pattern to make the molds. So that is the case with a fair number of those raised number eight size cast iron pans. Uh, the other thing I remember about that SMS, in fact, was not only did it have the raised number eight on the lid, on the handle rather, it also had a very thick and heavy bottom underneath. 
So maybe that might help to identify yours as well, perhaps. Thoughts on the fire up skillet? Uh, I never heard of the fire up skillet until you told me, until you said that right now. Yeah, exactly. Unknown foundry. Uh, does a ghost mark on cast iron increase the value? Do you have any ghost mark uh, cast iron you can show? I'll, I sort of have one, um, but um, um, collectors, I would think, would find ghost marks to be, uh, you yeah, know, to increase the value. But I don't think it's very much um, because, um, it, again, it's not one of those things I think that that uh, really stands out in the antique market. I may be wrong. I'm not exactly a professional cast iron seller. But I mean, ghost ghost marks. I don't think really have much an effect of an effect on the value of a, of a pan in general. The closest I have to a ghost mark is in fact on that uh, be, on that lodge uh, deep fryer there, because it um, not only does it have a made in USA mark on it, but it also has uh, the in much fainter uh, writing. The original model number, the model 3060, um, from uh, that BSR used in their uh, patterns there for their for their lids. I'm sorry for their uh, deep fryers, um, and it it's definitely lighter, and so that I guess you could say that is a ghost mark. So, <laughs> um, not sure if I should actually lift that thing up again, but I could do my best and try to. Uh, uh, show that ghost mark. Uh, yeah. So far, I've had to lift this thing twice, so I'm definitely getting some exercise tonight. I will say that much. There's the lid, and here is uh, the deep fryer. Mm. Oh, man. This, oh, the bottom of this is... Oh, I'm mad at myself now. I'm going to have to clean up the bottom of this. Sorry about that. However, I'm not even sure if I can show it right, but maybe in the light. If you look in the light, you can see here is the Made in USA. Uh, and yet, just above it, and it's very, very hard to see, but there is actually a ghost mark that says Model 3060. But I don't think the light is showing this very well. Doing my best to try to uh, dis try to display it, but I guess I'm, I guess it's not showing up well in this in this light. But man, I didn't even realize the bottom of this was so bad. I'm, I'm definitely gonna have to clean this up. I mean, I have used this thing, and the inside is nice. The outside, apparently, though, I think I'm gonna have to refurbish. Okay, project coming up. Ugh, that's the best I can say. But then again, that's why they call them ghost marks as well, because, well, <laughs> they're hard to see. So um, that's the best I could say there. So I can sort of see that there is something. Yeah, I'm afraid that's about all I could do. I can always take a picture of it, I think, and post it, which I should probably do so anyway, uh, maybe when the live is over. So Lodge still makes the number eight Camp Dutch oven. I just verified it on their website. Okay, that's good. Because no, because well, no, it means I don't have a collector's item, but I would rather that Dutch oven be available for people because it is quite useful. So that's good. So they miss, they must have just temporarily discontinued it, which they do with some of their pieces once in a while. Yeah, you know we're getting ready. <laughs> you know what we're getting ready for. Sounds like uh, somebody's got some uh, cooking to do this weekend, and I hope that's uh, interesting. I hope you have a, uh, a lot of fun doing that. So, and hello as well to Cast Iron Fanatic. Lodge still makes my alarm didn't go off. Oh, hello, Papa Dan. That's all right. Uh, you're, you know, you're still uh, plenty early here, Papa Dan. Nothing to worry about. A few ghost marks do up the value, like an eerie ghost mark on a WAPIC skillet or WAPAC. <laughs> Most don't change the value, but they're really cool. Yes, exactly. So that's. That's just it. When did they stop making rings on the bottom of the pan for Griswold and, and Wagner? Um, oh, I see. You're talking about the uh, basting. Yeah, because uh, Griswold lids had circular rings on the inside. Uh, I think they continued them all the way through 
to the end of uh, production for Griswold lids or maybe even uh, Wagner lids as well because at some point Wagner discontinued making cast iron lids completely and they just simply focused on glass lids. Definitely in the 1970s, so I would say somewhere between the 60s and 70s. Griswold, as we know, was acquired by the same corporation that had acquired Wagner. And so they were both owned by the same company from 1957 all the way to the end of Wagner's life. And um, my understanding is that Griswold was eventually phased out during the 60s and by the late, se no, by the early 70s, Griswold uh, production was simply uh, ceased altogether. Um, I would say, though, that they continued producing the rings on the Griswold lids all the way up until the time when they stopped making Griswold lids. I have seen unmarked Griswold lids without the Griswold logo, but they still have the rings. So they're, so I guess I hope that's about as good an answer as uh, I can give. <laughs> so when did Lodge start putting Lodge on the helper handle? Um, only recently, I think it may only been, well, definitely within the past decade or so. Um, so we're talking within 10 years. Because, yeah, I don't remember, because I believe I noticed it as well that the newer Lodge pans do still have a, uh, yeah, that have the Lodge logo on them. Excuse me one second. Ugh. Like here's one, for instance. This is the uh, last year's uh, walk. This is last year's Cracker Barrel skillet, the Walking Liberty. And boy, am I glad I acquired that one. This one is a beauty. And yet it still has the Lodge. It has the Lodge logo because, again, this one was produced only last year. Um, whereas going through this collection here, uh, here's the Buffalo Nickel skillet from 2014. 14? Um, yeah, it was 2014, and it still has the Lodge logo on it as well. Once again, this is the Buffalo Nickel skillet, and it does have the Lodge logo on it. So that means we're talking at least nine years here. Um, looking at all of these Cracker Barrel skillets, uh, it looks like they all have the Lodge logo on them. So... We're probably talking again, maybe around the past decade or so, when Lodge started uh, putting the uh, name on the helper handle. You ever have a Lodge four-in-one skillet? I've never had one myself. Uh, the FS, the foursome, made until '92. They were that recent. Wow, I didn't know that. Guess what? They were guessing that they were the same size. Don't know what they're called now. Well, yeah, Lodge. One amazing thing about Lodge cast iron is that it seems as though that Lodge has, has had the same size in all of their pans going all the way back to their early days. Uh, namely, that a, a uh, single-notch Lodge would fit a modern-day Lodge lid, for instance. So, But I have never owned a Lodge 4-in-1, I'm afraid. I've seen them several times, and they are a beauty of a skillet, of a not just a skillet, you know, with the cover and everything there, uh, beauty of a pan or, or a double set, but I've never owned one myself, unfortunately. So, Elsie's cat, what did I miss? Well, I showed off a, uh, I showed off a uh, deep fryer a couple of times, and we've been talking about the Lodge logo on helper handles, uh, as well as ghost marks. Uh, Jimmy Langford, I picked up a, a glass lid in a thrift store today at random. It has USA on the rim, and it fit my Wagner number seven and my Lodge number seven. There you go. Um, yeah, that sounds like you got yourself a real score there, all right. Um, it's actually not hard, I found, find a thrift store lid that will fit a modern day or even not so modern Lodge or uh, Wagner. They are, the Lodge and Wagner number eight <clears throat> is pretty close to a generic cast iron size as you can get. And there are a lot of things out there that will uh, still fit that. Um, if it said USA on it, you know, um, there's a possibility. I think maybe that might even be a Wagner lid. Uh, it's hard to say exactly. Um, I are, okay. I mean, 
the makers of uh, those crock pots, the ones that usually have uh, glass lids these days, are they made in the USA or are they all Asian made? I don't actually know that. So I would like to find a BSR Red Mountain number nine skillet. Yeah, you and me both, actually. The number nine and the number six Red Mountain skillets are rarities, and BSR collectors go crazy for them. They are very hard to find, yes, but if you look on the BSR group on Facebook, you will you will see them because a number of folks have been lucky to come, lucky enough to come across them. So, so yeah, that would indeed be uh, a rare find there. It was a dollar fifty. I'm presuming you mean that glass lid. So that yeah, definitely was a uh, uh, was a score for you, and congratulations on that, Jimmy. Okay. Uh, I bet it's looking real close. Yeah, on the side, Jimmy. I bet it's a Wagner. So, uh, four and one is uh, the four and one is a Lodge combo cooker. Yeah, similar to the chicken fryer that Lodge has today. Uh, however, um, yeah, because it it has a lid. I believe, if I remember right, it's a hinged lid. However, you know, it has a deep bottom and it has a uh, lid, but it has a Beautiful, beautiful design on it. Very elaborate as well. The handle has a uh, hammered uh, design going down the handle. And the top of it, in fact, the lid has a cross logo on it to the point where some people say Lodge imitated Griswold. I'm not so sure about that. But it is something similar to the Griswold cross, except instead of Griswold, it actually says that four in one. That's the and that's why they call it the Lodge four in one. It's a uh, re really uh, attractive looking piece, and uh, so it's one of those things that collectors really do jump on if they ever if they ever find one of them. So Lodge happens to make glass lids for all their skillets, and they put the wags too. Well, yeah, yeah I'm not surprised. Um, the, I would guess then Lodge has a glass foundry down there in South Pittsburgh now. Uh, or I wonder, do they actually order their glasswares from another uh, manufacturer? If they do, they do. I mean, that's just how business is done. I mean, BSNR, for instance, uh, in the 1970s, they uh, put a big emphasis on glass lids, even though they never produced glass lids themselves. Um, for instance, they made a point uh, with their Lady Best series, and now I'm able to show this thing off again, uh, that uh, these things were meant especially to fit with glass lids, or they came with glass lids. That's it. They actually came with glass lids. But again, the glass lids were provided to BSNR from, a, uh, from another manufacturer, because um, as far as I know, BSNR never did have a glass foundry. I finally got a five-star skillet for my bullseye lid. Well, congratulations for that. It should be here in the next couple of days. Well, there you go. All right. Do you have any combo cookers in your collection to show? Um, yes, I do, in fact. Um, and here, uh, well, I don't know if you consider it a combo cooker, more like a uh, Wagner chicken fryer which is essentially a deep skillet with a Wagner lid. And it's unmarked as well. It does not have the Wagner logo, but it does have the uh, sawtooth uh, logo on it. Um, but if you're talking about a combo cooker with a hinged lid, I'm afraid I do not have one of those, I'm sorry to say. I guess because, well, once again, I've got all these things here in my collection. I haven't had a need, especially for a combo cooker. Uh, at one point in one of my trips down south, I did manage to find a, to find the deep uh, skillet bottom for one of those Blankenship series combo cookers, but I never was able to find the uh, lid, a matching lid for it, and I ended up selling the uh, the bottom of it. In fact, okay, I have an FS bottom, but never came across a four. Oh. Uh, four in one lid yet. Yeah, exactly. That's why all we can do, unfortunately, is keep on looking. That's really about all we can see. So, BSR number 12, huh? Yeah. Uh, congratulations, LC's cat on a BSR number 12. Oh, yeah. What's a number 12 large block Griswold skillet sell for? 
I have a chance maybe to buy one. You just want to offer him a fair price. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, a large logo, Griswold number 12. Well, if you look on uh, eBay, you'll probably see that thing selling at, well, let's just say a ridiculous price. Uh, I would guess several hundred dollars, anywhere from 200 to who knows what. Because it's Griswold, I mean, of course. Um, I typically would call one-third of the eBay price to be a fair price. So <laughs> even though that's because I'm a cheapskate. And yeah, I've recently I've gotten some criticism, in fact, from some sellers uh, with the way I keep coming down on them uh, for this. To, because as they say, they're just trying to make a living and usually they can do pretty good business anyway. Well, all more power to them. But... That um, I really <clears throat> would not buy Griswold on eBay unless you came across an extremely unlikely good deal for it. I learned my life lesson with uh, Griswold. Um, boy, we're talking more than 10 years ago now with my uh, Griswold large logo number 10 skillet. Uh, that was the one where... Uh, early on in this little crazy obsession and hobby of mine, I did have the urge to uh, own a Griswold at first. I had this burning desire to actually have a Griswold. And I ended up getting a uh, Griswold number 10 from uh, on eBay for that. And in fact, I still have it. Here it is right here. And I've gotten quite a bit of use out of it as well. A number 10 large logo Griswold. And then only about two weeks after I acquired this from eBay, I went to the Brimfield Antique Show for the first time. And there at Brimfield, I came across this very same pan, the you know, large logo Griswold number 10, selling for half of what I paid for it on eBay. So let's uh, so all I can say is that was a life lesson for me. <laughs> And I have yet to buy any more Griswold on eBay after that. So, <laughs> so for a Griswold number 12, um, as you can see, I'm not really good at being able to offer a fair price for it. Um, I might suggest anywhere in the neighborhood of $100 to $200. If you're lucky, you may be able to get it for about that price. That's, I guess that's the best I could say. So... I own Corey Clark. I own lots of Griswold, but my favorite pen is my number 12 BSR. And I don't blame you for that either. Um, number 12 slant logo, Eerie, with a mismatched old lodge lid just sold for $426 on the Goodwill auction site. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yet another example for the, of that. So, And thank you. Uh, yeah, that reminds me. I've got to keep, uh, keep close, a closer look on the Goodwill auction site as well. I sometimes use a lid in the morning, depending on how I make eggs. <laughs> He's a local farmer, just wanted to offer a fair price, but that's out of my price range. Well, the least you can do at least is uh, send him a message and ask what he would be willing to sell it for. Maybe you might be able to strike a bargain with him nonetheless. Uh, I looked at eBay one time. Once was enough. Yes, exactly. Do you know of equivalent events like Brimfield in other states? Um, I have not looked heavily. Uh, I do know that here in New York, now that I'm in New York, there is the uh, the Bouckville, oh God, Madison Antique Week that is up around the area of Syracuse. And they hold this like about three or maybe even four times a year. And I went there once, as a matter of fact. I've already been there once. And it's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, not as big as Brimfield. But then again, I'm spoiled because Brimfield is one of the biggest in the country. However, they still had a nice uh, selection and probably over a 1,000 vendors there at uh, Balkville as well. So uh, I definitely had time, uh, fun looking, that, looking uh, that over as well. So... Really, I'm, I'm close enough that I could seriously consider going there just on a Saturday morning or something. If I left at about 4 o'clock in the morning, I probably would get there by about 6 to 7. So that's not so bad. Maybe I'll consider it. And hello, uh, 4GM44 as well. There's a similar fair in Cutstown, 
Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's the same size as Brimfield. Well, as I said, on the first place, I'm biased. Remember that, folks. I am biased because I lived right by Brimfield, and I lived in that area for more than 10 years. So I got to go to Brimfield many times. <laughs> um, but now that I'm no longer in that area and Brimfield would become a real road trip for me, I recognize that, well, I was privileged. <laughs> so <clears throat> nonetheless, there are quite a few antique fairs around, especially since we are now getting into the season for it. It's May. And really, at this point, the yard sales are in full bloom, if it, if it ever stops raining, that is. And that's when we're getting into things like antique fairs. And besides, there's one thing I have not yet been that a lot to, but a lot of you folks have been to, and that is the highway yard sales. You folks down south seem to have several of them. You've got the world's longest yard sale and the Route uh, 27 or something yard sales. There are a number of those highway yard sales down in your area that I have yet to go to, unfortunately. So <laughs> then you can uh, find some pretty good uh, deals there, too. So they're in that in that respect, you might even say that they may very well be as close to uh, Brim, um, as closer to the size of Brimfield. Cutstone is closer to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania than Massachusetts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh you got a black eye? Well, my condolences for that. I'd love to go to Brimfield. Yeah, I know. I mean, that Brimfield is one thing that I do miss already, even though I've been gone for less than a year. So, but, well, there's always the future. I mean, there's no reason why I couldn't plan a weekend road trip at some point. So, hmm. all right. First Monday in Canton. Oh, yeah. I'd heard about the Canton, Texas. Uh, antique fair as well so yeah there are some other antique fairs uh, throughout the country and the best i could say is well if you do a uh, google search you should be able to find them easily enough because if these uh, antique fairs are that big then you're guaranteed to find them on google so i remember when you could go through canton and you could see it all no more it takes all week now to see it all yes exactly it was the same way with brimfield as well with brimfield the whole town literally lives around the antique shows so all right and going on here What's the lid on the floor that's on your sad iron griddle? Uh, okay, um, let me see. I'm trying to think which one you're referring to here. Um, sad iron griddle. Oh, um, let me see. This is one that I definitely have to clean up again. A number of my pans, unfortunately, during the move, it's like they got into this poor condition. I've got to make a serious effort to clean these things up. This is simply a modern day lodge number five lid, which uh, actually I have gotten some use at, out of it. So I'm mad at myself for letting it get into this condition. I definitely need to, I should, I've got to drop this thing in the lie tank right away, in fact. So, and uh, start cleaning this thing up immediately because uh, a number five lid goes great with a number five lodge skillet, and you can definitely get a lot of use out of that. That's for sure. So, <laughs> thanks all week. Um, beyond that, uh, over here, I've been since I've been moving things around. Uh, this is just simply a number ten, no number ten, number eight lodge lid that will fit any lodge pan. Uh, and this, on the other hand, again, is the uh, wildlife cover for the uh, Lodge Deep Fryer here. Really nice design on it, too. The other side, by the way, is a grill. And uh, I was lucky enough to get some use out of that only recently when I made those arayas for uh, my April Fool's Day video. So I remember when everything, uh, Papa Dan, I remember when everything was outside under shade trees or in the sun at Canton back in the 70s. No buildings then except bathrooms. <laughs> Never seen a cast iron lid for number five. Um, if I remember right, in fact, I got it at the Lodge Factory Store. Yeah, that's right. I, that's where I got it from. They're at the National Cornbread Festival. And I believe it was in their seconds area. And so, yeah, I definitely picked it up for that reason. 
because I realized I could use a number five lid, <clears throat> and I certainly did. So, yeah, so my bad for letting it get into this condition. I, this is, I'm going to really have to clean this thing up immediately. Probably when this is over, in fact, I will go out <clears throat> and put a couple of these things into the uh, lie tank right away. Rather than sit around saying that I need to clean them up. <laughs> and that's how he started his Canadian connection. People that live there don't have to pay city taxes because of all the tax revenue from first Monday. <laughs> and uh, that shout you hear coming from L.A. is mine. Okay, I'm wondering what, what uh, Mud Brooker has done now. <laughs> Someone gave me a hammered lid for my bottom for nothing. Oh, I see. Wow. That's impressive. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for being so generous. <laughs> really the best I can say there. So uh, I'm in Canada and Nevada, but I have Navy friend, Davy friends in Arkansas and Louisiana who are out, who look out for iron for me. Yes, indeed. If, if, if your friends and family have standing orders to uh, look for cast iron for you, then you might have cast ironitis. For that matter, if your friends and family come up and say, you know, I found this cast iron pan and I thought of you, then you, might, then you probably have cast ironitis. <laughs> and yeah, I, that certainly happened as well. Uh, and that, all, that also reminds me, um, you know, I remember when I made my video of, uh, of a, an unboxing of an Asian made cast iron skillet. You know, it was a cheap big lot skillet and I still did a full unboxing and I cooked with it and everything. And people were commenting and there's, and those comments are still there. In fact, it's like, why would you get an Asian made cast iron pan where you can get a large skillet for cheap? And there are in fact reasons for that. I mean, number one being of course that even getting a large skillet for cheap uh, for some folks that may still be out of their budget. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So, I mean, yes, it's possible you could find a large cast iron pan at a flea market or thrift store, and they are out there. It's much more likely you could find an Asian made cast iron pan at a thrift store or a flea market at a more affordable price. And that's one reason why a number of people uh, use uh, Asian made cast iron pans because they're there and because they're affordable, even if they are cheaply made and they have that rough surface. For that matter, what happens if your family or friends uh, give you an Asian made cast iron pan as a present? You know, I got this for you because I know you love cast iron. And then it's like, what are you going to do? You got to throw it out and say, oh, it's Asian made. Take it away. No, I no, of course not. And so I accept it as a gift and uh, do what I can with it. Uh, in fact, my in fact, uh, my brother gave me a uh, set of four uh, number three sized Asian made pans. I used one of them as my Crisco uh, holder. I just keep Crisco on it by the stove. Uh, so that I can grease my pans with it uh, regularly. Hmm. Cast Iron Fanatics Home was kind to me. Well, thank you very much again, uh, my brooker. Randy Duffy Lodge is awesome, but some Asian-made cast iron are good too. Yes, that I mean, that is a fact. Uh, I mean, as much as we all love made in USA, and yes, some, yeah, a number of Asian-made cast iron pans are cheaply made. Some of them are very well made. Camp Chef, for instance, has a good quality control uh, in their uh, cast iron pans, made in Asia or not, and it's arguable, arguably Camp Chef skillets could very well be on the same level of Lodge in terms of the quality of modern day uh, cast iron. So there's one for you. Likewise, the house brand at uh, Cabela's is made by Camp Chef as well. And Mudbrooker also mentioned uh, Tech Sport uh, cast iron pans uh, that you can get at sporting goods stores. They're definitely Asian made and they are rougher, but there's still no reason why we can't use them. So. <laughs> And going on here, I have the Ida's Handsome Stone cleaning a Wagner pan that I'm picking up this weekend, his grandma's. Oh, yeah, there you go. Exactly. It's like if half of, no, 
if half or more of the pans in your to be seasoned pile are actually from friends and family, you might have cast iron <laughs> Okay, what else do we have here? If someone gave me cheap Asian pans, I'd do like Cynthia and spray them with Teflon. Well, you can do what you want with it. It's your cast iron. I have a Camp Chef Dutch oven. It weighs about 45 pounds. Uh, what's the history on your Stover waffle maker? Oh, yeah, the waffle iron. <laughs> Boy, I'm just glad that that's over with, cleaning that thing up. Oof. Um, well, I did some research with the, uh, Stover waffle iron. I guess I'd better, uh, get it for show here. Uh, give me just a few seconds, folks, and we'll bring it out as soon as I get my hands on it. There we go. Okay. Here it is, folks. And I don't want to drop it, that's for sure. Ugh. But here it is. The Stover Waffle Iron. And yeah, this thing was, this thing took a while to clean up, that's for sure. And believe me, anybody who uh, thinks that cleaning a corn stick pan is difficult, that's nothing compared to something like this, that's for sure. But yes, this is made by Stover Manufacturing of Freeport, Illinois. And I did some research on them because I'm a geek, and I found out that Stover Stover Manufacturing actually had several different divisions all under Stover Manufacturing, and they were most famous as a maker of bicycle parts. Stover apparently was in business from the uh, mid-1800s to the uh, early or first part of the 20th century. Um, but the only piece of hollowware, namely kitchen items, that they, that they appear to have ever made in fact, were these Stover waffle irons. They never made cast iron skillets or pots or Dutch ovens or anything like that. They just, for whatever reason, at one point produced these waffle irons. And furthermore, they produced quite a few of them as well because uh, even today, 100 years later, it's not too difficult to find a Stover waffle iron. I've seen a couple of them as well, even before I uh, even before I acquired this one here. So, um, <clears throat> so that so yeah, that silver waffle iron there probably I would estimate dates to around the 1920s or so, which means it's just about a hundred years old. But it's still made waffles. I've used it twice now already, and so far I've made a total of eight waffles in it. Seven of them have not stuck. Well, make it six and a half. One partially stuck. Um, so that's not a bad track record for starters, and all I can do is keep on practicing. <laughs> Debbie, I remember when they sold Teflon in a cab or can, I guess, and you could respect your skillets. I've never had any Teflon. Sure. Okay. Oh, I see. In other words, you're saying you could spray a nonstick coating onto your, uh, onto your cast iron pans. <laughs> 45 pounds. Oof, enjoy your exercise. Um, oh, yeah. One other thing about uh, Camp Chef as well. I mean, Camp Chef makes this thing called the Ultimate Dutch Oven, which is a huge, is it 12-inch size, I think, uh, Dutch oven with a uh, what I think is like a circulation tube in the center. You know, it looks like, if not a bunt pan, it looks more like a tube pan except the thing is huge, it's cast iron, and it, again, it's about 12 inches in diameter. And then, of course, to, uh, Camp Chef also made the Ultimate Turkey Roaster, which is a two-part, you know, uh, two set of what look like Dutch ovens, and they're meant especially that you could fit an entire turkey in them. You know, I have to say, the turkeys I've seen made in, the, uh, in that uh, Ultimate Turkey Roaster don't look so great. Because what you end up with is a braised turkey rather than a roasted turkey. But then that's just me. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, the ultimate turkey roaster was discontinued by Camp Chef a few years ago. And since then, just like any, dis and just like any discontinued piece of cast iron, it now is a collector's item. So um, if you find an ultimate turkey roaster, you've definitely got something on your hands. <laughs> Would the stove or waffle iron be uh, set into the opening of a wood stove? Uh, does it have a fire ring? It absolutely 
does. And here it is. Although, yes, here is the uh, base of that uh, waffle iron. Although, as you can see, it actually has something of a rounded bottom here. I think it's meant actually to fit on the outside of a stove ring as opposed to inside the stove ring or the stove eye. But it's definitely meant more as something for a uh, for a uh, wood burning stove because uh, both times I've used it on my uh, on my stovetop burner, it's been kind of awkward and I've had to keep it from falling off. But that's largely because the burners in my uh, uh, on my stovetop they are they're square shaped rather than circular, <laughs> so that does make it a little more difficult to use this thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> so so I hope that helps. Um, I just checked; it isn't. I've posted a little bit above. Should have posted. Rick D, Cynthia Wesley. I had woo whole place to myself. Oh well, that's good. Uh, if you had to only keep one piece in your collection, which one? I can't even answer that. <laughs> um, I guess if there was only one piece in my collection that I could keep. It would have to be the good old 10-inch uh, skillet, whether it might be my modern-day Lodge Redneck Pan or my number eight Red Mountain uh, BSR skillet. But, I mean, I guess there's really, if there's one thing that absolutely everybody needs in their kitchen, it's at least one number eight size 10-inch cast iron skillet. So I guess that would probably be the best uh, answer I could give. Uh, if I had to keep two pieces, it would probably be the number eight skillet and a uh, number eight size bare Dutch oven. And then we go on from there. So <laughs> that's the, uh, so I guess that's the best answer I can give. The high base waffle irons were made for gas stoves, so you could just spin the iron. Yeah. Oh yeah. I saw your video of making waffles on your own, uh, wood stove, uh, waffle iron as well. There's a very interesting design on that on that waffle maker, the kind where, as you said, you can just whap it and it spins around. That's that's actually pretty neat, and I definitely would not be able to do that on my gas stove. That's for sure. For a four-in-one lid, I'll find you even uh, even after I drive to Alabama. <laughs> hello, Billy Lee Lawton as well, and hello, Michael Markey. Greetings from Georgia, and yay, we were worried. Fortunately, we are still here for at least a little while longer. We passed an hour, but typically it seems like these things seem to run at least an hour and a half, depending on how long I keep talking and talking until I, until my throat finally gives out. <laughs> what is the difference between a high base and a low base for a waffle iron? The difference is a couple of inches, actually. This is a low base uh, in that you can see that it's you know very close to the uh, stove. Uh, very close to the uh, actual stove itself. The high base, on the other hand, this wall here is like one or two inches higher, so that it's what, so that the actual uh, waffle iron itself, uh, instead of being down here close to the stove, close to the stove, it's actually way up here, so that you could spin it around, like he said. Um, so this is definitely a low base, and again, I gotta be careful. I don't want to drop this thing. There we go. So that's the difference between a high base and a low base. Obviously, the high base ones are a lot more rare, harder to find as well. Also, <clears throat> it seems that these waffle irons, uh, they're all unique or proprietary in that in just about every case I've found, uh, it seems people say that a, a waffle iron will not fit the base from another manufacturer. So that this Stover waffle iron I have here, for instance, the paddles would not fit on, say, a Griswold waffle base. And that's kind of a shame because in my lie tank, I have a pair of Waypack or Wapping. Is, I always thought it was WAPIC. I'm told it might be WAPAC. But I have actually a WAP, let's say WAPAC, pair of waffle irons, uh, yeah, waffle paddles. I do not have the base for it. And it's been sitting there in the line tank for a good couple of years or so because, I've, well, 
it was so difficult to get that one cleaned up that, yeah, cleaning this one up, I can't say I'm exactly looking forward to it. Especially since, that's right, this uh, way pack, uh, these wood paddles, they need wooden handles and they don't have them. So I'd have to make handles for it as well. I also do not have the base for it, unfortunately. It would be my, if I could keep only one, it would be my seven quart lodge Dutch oven. I could cook, fry, bake everything in it. Yes, exactly, Sherlock Holmes. That cup base makes a lot of sense for those who overfill the batter. Well, there is that too. And I have no doubt it was uh, designed that way. Uh, because, yeah, so far I've definitely overfilled the batter in my waffle maker as well. I may, Each time I've made a big mess on the stove. The waffles have been pretty successful though. So I'm, I'm actually happy about that. Wapak. Wapakoneta, Ohio is right up the road. Wapak. All right, I'm going to have to try to say that instead of WAPAC and instead of WAPAC, it's more like WAPAC. I'll try to remember that. I do want to get the pronunciation right for the same reason that I don't want to be one of those many people who can't pronounce Worcestershire sauce. You know, it's like Worcestershire sauce or wash your sister sauce or Worcester sauce. It's Worcestershire. And I've known that at least since I was a kid. <laughs> I would keep my BSR deep fish fryer. Well, yeah, because I will admit, though, that deep that deep fryer there does just about everything. You can use it as a Dutch oven. You can use it as a skillet. And also, I found as well, the nice thing about using those deep skillets, or that deep fryer for that matter, is that if you fry things in it, those high walls will block a lot of the grease splatter and make less of a mess on the stove. And that's actually... <laughs> Pretty important as well. Behind you, hanging from the second shelf, is a smaller oblong item above the glass lid. Um, behind you, hanging from the second shelf, is a small... Uh, oh, oh, this. This, in fact, is a cauldron. Um, uh, I found this one on my birthday, in fact, uh, several years ago. I can't believe it's already been that long. Come on, let's do this right. Let me get this thing out here. Here it is. Ugh. And ugh. Ugh. as best as I could tell, this is the genuine item. This, I believe, would ha is most likely a 19th century cauldron. And I could say that mostly because of the uh, flat top ears here on the side. Uh, it also has a uh, very noticeable gate mark on the bottom, as well as a sprue mark on the side. You see this, this mark here where the two halves of the mold came together here. This is a uh, nice uh, big cauldron. I found this on my birthday several years ago, and so naturally that makes it special. I mean, what's more, I only paid 20 bucks for it, so yeah, I did not want to pass it up. The disadvantage, I'm sorry to say, is that, in fact, the legs here, I think either the legs were broken off or cut off at some point in the past because it does not sit flat. Yeah, the, uh, it actually, the bottom of this thing here is longer than the legs. And so if I put it on a flat surface, it wobbles. Let me see if I can find a place to put it. Uh, like here, for instance. Ugh. I mean, yes, it does stand up right, but it definitely wobbles. However, uh, for 20 bucks, I was not about to pass that up. And besides, I could just, if I really want to use this thing for cooking, I could just hang it from a tripod. So there's no problem at all with that. Hmm. Uh, except in this case, it would be bubble, bubble, mobly in trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that is a loaf pan. Um, what are we looking for here? Yeah, it's a nice cauldron as well. Yeah, use it for deep frying chicken outside. In fact, I have deep fried a whole chicken in this at least once for my mom's birthday. So it does, these things do make excellent deep fryers. Definitely no question about that. All right. Um, I see a lot of, find a lot of them at scrap yards. I can purchase them at scrap price. Wow. That's all American prepper. 
Yeah, I've, I've seen that. Yeah, I've only been to a couple of scrap yards, and I have yet to find piles of cast iron at those scrap yards. It owed the wrong people uh, back in the day. I guess you're talking about the cauldron here and the legs being cut off. Well, be that as it may, that's just how it turned out. There are quite a few spiders out there as well that uh, have had the uh, legs cut off. And this was done largely so that they could continue to be used on wood-burning stovetops, on flat-top stoves. And so they're actually uh, fairly common, and you see them, and they have a gate mark on the bottom, and these three little nubs where the legs used to be. Hmm. All right, I was thinking, I was thinking a Worcester mass to keep me somewhat in the line for pronouncing the name of the, of the sauce. Yes, exactly. That's pretty much the same thing, Worcester, uh, Massachusetts, which I know, I don't think I ever want to see that town again. All right. Okay. Uh, got it. Thought maybe it was a ham boiler. Yeah. Unfortunately, I do not have a ham boiler. Well, maybe I do. Sort of. Um, this is one interesting piece here. <clears throat> and it's definitely shaped like a ham boiler. As you can see, it even has the uh, handles of a ham boiler. But look at the size of this thing. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I was, at, I keep forgetting it, but it has a marking uh, on the bottom as well. It says HB84. And I'm told this is actually from a small foundry uh, in the South in the early 20th century. And it was pointed out, and I'd have to uh, do a look on Facebook for the name of that foundry again. At first, I thought this was Lodge, but apparently it's not. I remember I saw a picture of this little thing on uh, Facebook once uh, several years back, and I thought, and yeah, I thought this is pretty cute, and I wouldn't mind owning one of them. And I was, once again, astounded to actually come across uh, this myself, and I paid 15 bucks for it. So, uh, yeah, I certainly, as I said, this is one of those things that I really enjoy using. And it's just the right shape, even though it has a rounded bottom rather than a flat bottom. This could very well be used as a loaf pan. And I have made a couple of uh, loaves in this as well. So, so, uh, this is, so in regards to a ham boiler, this is probably the closest thing I have to it. Although you may want, though you may say that my deep fryers are probably more like a ham boiler, except that this is shaped exactly like a ham boiler. <laughs> All right, getting on with it here. I won the number eight boiler at the auction. Unfortunately, it's time to get to bed. Well, I'm sorry about that, LC's cat, but it was nice to see you here tonight. So, okay, what was this about last video here? My pot from mud uh, because he broke my no wind streak and my snowflake from Lewis. Oh, that's Cynthia Wesley. If nothing else, leave a comment on my last video and I can give it to you as a reply. Oh, I see. And going down the list here, my second choice to keep my Vivor brand 10 quart. Uh, stainless steel brazier pan for cooking 10 to 16 pounds of meat for canning foods uh, like buffalo filling in quart jars. Well, that sounds pretty impressive in itself, that's for sure. It is on the bottom, Billy. Yeah, and thank you. Oi. Well, doing, doing uh, pretty good so far anyway. Um, you know, and, but anyway, if nothing else as well, thank you as well, folks for uh, bringing out a couple of the uh, more unusual pieces in my collection because I'm more than happy to uh, to uh, display these. I mean, I, there's, I mean, you've heard this story before that, you know, that they've made pretty much cast iron in all shapes and sizes over the past two to 300 years. And, uh, and so as a result, if it's out there, it's in cast iron and eventually you can find it. It's really just a matter of luck more than anything else in the old treasure hunt. <laughs> Wonder what brand is on the handle. Oh, I see you're still talking about that. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. Luck is all we need. And you never know when it's going to happen. I mean, I've been, I've found, I've made a couple of incredible scores 
at uh, cast iron, at uh, flea markets that were run down and they, and they just looked like garbage heaps. Uh, at the Worcester Flea Market, which is now closed for good, um, in one t at that very same flea market, but in like maybe about a year apart, once I came across a Griswold Victor number nine skillet, and I paid five bucks for it. And then for, I think it was only three bucks, I got a Wapak, I pronounced it correctly, Wapak number 12. I had a number 12 Wapak skillet. And I ended up trading that Wapak skillet. Uh, I think, I think, yeah, that's right. I think that was where I got my uh, Red Mountain number twelve lid, my BSR Red Mountain number twelve lid, which I actually consider to be a pretty decent deal right there. Currently, I have the uh, number twelve BSR Dutch oven, which I have to uh, put through the E tank. And that I'm going to be doing uh, pretty soon as well, too. I will say that. So are there any pieces that you love just for the history of it? Um, several, I would say. My gate mark skillets, for one. I have two gate mark skillets. A, uh, a typical uh, teardrop shape handle, number seven, that I call Lucky. And a fancy handled uh, gate mark, number seven nine size skillet and i just call it my fancy handle number nine skillet so those i definitely enjoy for the history that's for sure uh a number of my older bsnr pans i think i could say the same thing as well like this um for instance this um bsr number eight dutch oven that i was lucky enough to uh, acquire this year not only is it a uh, number eight bsr but it's also their, from their handwritten series here, and you can see that here uh, from the logo, the 8A. It's actually handwritten. Uh, the earliest generation, it's believed, of the Red Mountain series. And even though I already have a Griswold number 8 Dutch oven, I could not resist this BSR number 8 Dutch oven, especially for the history. They're probably about the same age, in fact, or maybe even the Griswold might be older, yet... I appreciate the history more, I think, on the uh, BSNR Dutch oven. So there is definitely history for you. On the other, other hand, well, you never know what's going to be, uh, what's going to have history. Because one thing uh, recently that you can definitely say has some history would be the Lodge Made in America skillets. These ones here from 2018 and 2020. Uh, I've done a video, in fact, on these uh, two on these particular pans because even though Lodge only seemed to produce these for three years, uh, two of them already had some interesting history to them, especially the 2020 skillet, the Rosie the Riveter skillet, which was uh, released in 2020 and happened to be released at just the same time that the pandemic was breaking out. So that was something like a stroke of good luck for Lodge in terms of selling the skillet. Um, Lodge took the high road as well, and they did not use the pandemic to sell that pan. So uh, that is definitely one reason why I'm proud to own that. Both of those two were so, uh, were so popular that Lodge has since re-released them without the date on them. So that now <clears throat> you can get the Rosie the Riveter skillet from Lodge, and you can get the Made in America skillet from Lodge, even though they don't have the uh, date on them. But nonetheless, we've got some history there, and I'm, I'm actually quite happy to own them for that reason. So i uh, got them all at once, Papa, $265. I'm hoping that was like for a collection or something. Do you have Volrath, and was it made in Chicago? Um... I don't know the history of Volrath as well as I should. I'm not sure where Volrath was made. Uh, I have what I believe is one unmarked Volrath. And that is over here. An unmarked Volrath number three. And my understanding is, is in fact, that this is indeed a Volrath, and they base that on the uh, shape of the handle here as well. So uh, this, I acquired this at a, a dirt cheap price. I don't even remember what I paid for it, but you know because it was just an uh, you know completely blank unknown cast iron pan. But some collectors have identified it as a Volrath. 
That's the only Volrath I have at this time. Uh, I did have a Volrath lid for a while, but I ended up selling that in addition. Uh, interestingly enough, I actually have a modern day pair of tongs from Volrath, made in India, no less. <laughs> so Volrath was made in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much, Mudbrooker. It was a while back when I had more money. Oh, okay. So, yes. Uh, yeah, Volrath was making cast iron like many companies uh, up through up until around World War II or so, but they discontinued their cast iron production. And, in fact, they, dis they stopped being a maker of uh, home cookware as well. And they have since focused on being a supplier for businesses, you know, restaurants and others. And they've uh, done very well for themselves in that respect, in that Volrath is very popular, well, just that, at restaurant stores and uh, suppliers, so that restaurants and, and commercial kitchens all across the country, quite a few of them do have Volrath equipment. They still make Volrath, uh, something about installs made in USA, I didn't get that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, um, Volrath does make some of their items themselves even now, but they do outsource a lot of it. As I mentioned, I have a pair of Volrath tongs, um, and I think it was actually made in India. Uh, but they, I, as far as I'm concerned, there's still nothing wrong with that, and it's a very durable pair of tongs, and I'm quite happy to have it too for that reason. So uh, just left a comment on cooking and cast iron for the first time. Yes. I have antique furniture made in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Yeah, Sheboygan is or was a very popular manufacturing uh, city, that's for sure. Uh, unfortunately, things have changed, and I can say that regrettably for pretty much the entire country, but that gets into another subject altogether. <laughs> um, All right, would like to see more usage of the solid Technics. Okay, yeah, that's true. I do have one particular pen here from Solid Technics as well that I definitely need to uh, use again soon, and that is the uh, uh, the uh, number. Yeah, that is the thirty centimeter Solid Technics big skillet. So um, this this is a piece I'm actually quite glad to own, especially since I had received it as a Christmas present. Uh, this was something I was not expecting to receive to receive at all. Oof. And I'm quite glad that I, that I have it. I know I've shown this one off before. This is the Solid Technics so-called big skillet, and it's 30 centimeters in size, or just a little bit bigger than 12 inches. It is a wonderful baking pan as well as a as well as a, a skillet. I mean, I've made pizzas, I've made ratatouille, I've made big cookies in this thing. This thing is a really really nice piece of cast iron. And then, of course, only a couple of years after I acquired this for Christmas was this 2015. I think it was. After only a couple of years, uh, Solid Technics discontinued their cast iron production completely. And now they are making, uh, while they are making carbon steel, they are also making, what do they call it now? Forged iron, I think. Uh, something like that. But either way, as far as I know, they have not continued production of this particular big piece of cast iron. So in a way, I guess I do have something of a collector's item here. And that was just, again, because of luck on my part. I'm very glad that we have it. Yeah, that's a big mule right there. Oh, yeah, no. I, I definitely enjoy enjoy this, that's for sure. This here is a skillet. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, just seeing your purchase, concerning your purchase of the Wapak skillets at the time, you stole them. Yeah, 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 I did say Wapak. There we go. So, yeah, this, again, was just happened to be a, a very generous and gift one that I'm grateful for, and that's why, yet again, I have no intention of ever selling this. And hopefully I won't ever have to. Several of my pan several of the pieces in my collection, I think I can safely say I'm going to have with me for the rest of my life. If some kind of a disaster happens and ugh, I end up getting rid of most of my collection for one reason or another, don't ask me why, I don't want to know. Um, there will be some pieces that I still want to keep pretty much for the rest of my life. You mentioned having one particular pan, like the, uh, like in my case, the Red Mountain skillet, or my, uh, or the uh, 
redneck skillet or the BSR Dutch oven. Yeah, maybe that uh, big skillet would be another one of those. Another one I would probably want to keep no matter what would be good old Stumpy, my number 14 BSR. <laughs> All right, when is New York going to ban new gas stove hookups? I do not know. I don't know the politics. Uh, if anything, it's this would be a political decision, and I have no knowledge whatsoever of that. I suppose it's possible it could happen at some point in the future, and if it does, well, then so it, so it goes. And I have very little uh, power over that. Maybe never. Because, again, it's politics. Who knows? That's about all I can say. Um, if nothing else, I could definitely say, though, that despite the conspiracy theory, they are not going to ban gas stoves. Not ones that, you know, nobody from the government is going to burst into your home and seize your gas stove. That is not going to happen. Folks may remember that there was a similar scare story going around about a decade ago, when that, when some scare uh, emails went around saying they're going to ban wood burning stoves, and of course nothing ever happened, nothing ever came of that either. So I base this uh, I base this in the uh, same way. While you may be correct, and maybe they might enact a ban on construction of new gas stove hookups. Um, they're not going to do anything about all of the uh, gas burning stoves, the gas stoves that are uh, already out there. So we get most of our natural gas from Russia. Um, okay, well, I know very little about that. <laughs> okay, we have liftoff, got your email address. Well, congratulations again for that. So, and at this point, Wow, we're already getting into that time, nonetheless. I mean, I mentioned about an hour and a half, and holy cow, it's actually been about an hour and a half. Once again, I'm just talking and talking about my collection, but, well, <laughs> that's why I've agreed to do this uh, once a month because, as I said, I have a lot of stories I like telling about this collection, and I, as you can see, give me half a chance and I will tell them. <laughs> what else can I say there? Uh, New Jersey is planning to ban all natural all natural gas. Well, again, if it happens, it happens. I mean, I suppose you could try to uh, work against it in in uh, you know in the halls of the state legislature, but that's really about uh, all I can say there. Sorry for taking up so much room in the chat. Who the thunk giving away cast iron could be so hard? No, not to worry at all, Mudbrooker. I mean, after all, I've just been talking and talking and talking anyway, so that's fine. How many in your collection? You know, I wild guess I would have to guess maybe around a hundred pieces. Uh, I have not. I have yet to take the time to actually physically count every single piece, so I can't answer that. And I'm just basing it just on observation here. The fact that I have all of this, and I have a third rack of enamel cast iron and cookware as well. Uh, in the kitchen, too, so. <laughs> All right. But nonetheless, I'd say we're probably getting onto that time as well because, you know, as I say, because it's true, it's a Wednesday night, and unfortunately, we can't keep this going up all night because most of us have to work tomorrow, and that includes me. I like your rack separated. How do you organize it? Um, I organize it pretty much... I guess by sizes. I've got number threes going into number fours and number fives. Uh, I think my number sixes and up are over here. I know six, seven, all my number eights. And then we go on nine, 10, and even 14. It's not exactly organized, it's just how it turned out. And in fact, I'm still working on a way to try to expand this a little more to display some of my, uh, you know, the uh, lodge skillets with all of the uh, Cracker Barrel designs on. So, but that's hopefully I'm going to have something on that uh, pretty soon as well. I tried counting, but it's always a failure. So my sissy is on the job. Yes, exactly. That's like the old joke, you know. It's like the shepherd says to his to his flock, "So how many are how many sheep are there?" And the sheep answer. 
We don't know. Every time we try counting ourselves, we all fall asleep. All right. Good thing about this is that there's no cleanup. Well, other than the fact I have several pans I need to put away, <laughs> but that is true. However, next week we are going to get back to the cooking because really I've said before, the cooking really is the number one thing here. Uh, I love cooking in cast iron. It's a lot of fun and, and I learn a lot of things too, as well as being to be able to provide you with some entertainment, I think, because not many other people are dumb enough to do a live cooking show every week, <laughs> but that's how it goes. And we will uh, get together and uh, do this all over again. So I can only thank everybody one, once again for, uh, being, for being kind enough to uh, be here this evening. I mean, it's a lot of fun being able to talk uh, with you folks here. And it's going to be a lot of fun cooking as well. And just most importantly, having you folks here on this channel, because that's really what makes, uh, what makes this all so entertaining. So thank you. And yes, thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, well, I do my best. I like sharing this information and, uh, likewise to everybody else as well, to Cynthia Wesley and Randy Duffy and RT Scott and Corey Clark. Um, and so I just, um, can only thank everybody so much for, uh, showing up here tonight. And, um, I, and the best I can say is that we will all do it, uh, all over again next week, or maybe even sooner than next week, because after all, We've got a couple of special days tomorrow uh, in the next couple of days, and, and I'm sure a lot of us will be cooking because tomorrow, of course, is May the 4th be with you. And I'm sure a lot of folks probably do some Star Wars themed cooking uh, tomorrow. And then, of course, Friday, it's Cinco de Mayo, beer day. And you know, one thing I like doing is making a beer cake. Uh, basically, you just make a chocolate cake and mix some beer into the batter. And it tastes terrific. If you've never made yourself a beer cake, do this on Friday. You will not regret it. Even if it just means mixing some beer in with a box cake mix, you will be surprised at how delicious it is. That I think I will recommend that to everybody. Make yourselves a beer cake. You're not, and you will like it. And having said that, I think we will uh, get going. Cinco de Mayo means fireworks in my neighborhood. No sleep, especially since it's a Friday this time. <laughs> so May the 5th is for the dark side of the cast force, the 6th. Sith, Sith. Oh, yeah, and then there's May 6th, the day of the Sith. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. But nonetheless, I can only thank everybody once again for showing up here. And well, all we can do now is just go on and uh, enjoy cooking and enjoy using your cast iron, folks. And once again, as we always say, see you next Wednesday. I trouble.